Hey guys, welcome to the Center Point Podcast. I'm your host, Tyler Woodham. Today we have a special guest. We have Monica Merrifield with us. Monica, thanks for being here. Well, thanks for inviting. This is already going to be a fun conversation. I'm excited about this one. So the topic today is singleness, dating, Valentine's Day, because Valentine's Day is in a couple of days. Um, and I guess if you listen to this after Valentine's Day, I hope you had a good Valentine's Day. Uh, but it's coming up in a couple of days for us um, by the time we record this. And um, I want to have a conversation again about singleness, dating, guys pursuing girls, how can girls be pursued, um, some, some interesting things. We'll talk about marriage a little bit, right? It's going to be fun. It is. Probably radically uncomfortable for the listeners. Maybe not. We'll, we'll see. <laughs> Depends on where we go. <laughs> <laughs> we'll see. The first, let's introduce Monica. Monica, tell us about yourself. Okay, well, I am Monica Merrifield, and I'm from Hawaii, and so that's all the way across the Pacific. I come from a very large family, but my immediate family right now, I'm married, and I have two children whom we adopted, and love them, love my family, um, but I just really have a really large extended family, and so I don't know if, well, just to give you a, an example is I come from a family with seven children. Okay. Yes. How was, how was that? It was always chaotic. And we lived in a two bedroom, one bath house. So we learned how to share very well. And so, um, so growing up, we didn't have a whole lot monetarily, but we had each other. And we had a really dysfunctional family, and so I was always thinking of ways that I would not have a dysfunctional family when I grew up. But, um, so, you know, I had these ideals in my head. And as I saw other people getting married around me, like after I graduated from college, actually during college, my roommate got engaged pretty readily. And so she was married by the time we were juniors in college. And so, you know, that whole marriage thing was always floating around in my head. And then I saw, started seeing all my other friends getting married. And then after college, more friends getting married. And so I was not. Where were you on, in the birth order? I was second in, out of seven, yes. Okay, okay. And so I, I was not the bossy one. My older sister was, but um, but I had a lot of responsibility. And so I think I took that upon myself and I try to control my life, Ooh, which is never, never, never a good thing. But um, anyway. And we're gonna talk more about that. Okay. Uh, but when we were talking about even the, the, with the topics of, hey, there's, when, we, when we release these, uh, these first several podcasts, it's gonna be right around Valentine's Day. So we need to do a podcast and have a conversation on, on Valentine's and, and being single through Valentine's Day or being married or dating through Valentine's Day. Who can we talk to? And it was unanimous uh, that people wanted to talk to you. So, uh, so here you are, and we're glad you're here. Uh, but share your story. I know, I know um, in talking to you and touch base on this uh, as well, if you don't mind, but you were previously engaged for a year. So include that if you don't mind, but share some yes. of your story now from, from singleness to where okay. you are now. So yes, I already mentioned that I was still single and I saw other people getting married around me and I started getting really anxious because I thought, well, shouldn't I be married too? That's part of my plan, you know, that I was trying to control. And so, um, and so I started dating someone because after all, he liked me, thought he was cute, liked him too. And then, you know, I just started going through in my brain, okay, so, he says he's a Christian, he, he's smart, yeah, sure. And so we dated for about two years and there were some things along the line that I kept thinking, ooh, this is dangerous. Ooh, I shouldn't be in this relationship. Ooh, I need to let go. But then I think the pressure of being alone and needing to to be married just allowed me to just settle. And so I said, sure, I'll marry you when this guy asked me to marry him. And how old were you at this time? At that time, I was about 23. Okay. Yes. And I graduated from college when I was 21, so yes. 
Yeah, so already you were feeling a little bit of, hey, I should be, oh, I should yes. be married by now, well, or at least in that, in that mean, direction. I mean, like, yes. Okay. I mean, I would say at least 50 of my friends okay. had gotten married by then, you know? So you go, you keep going to these weddings, and you're like, well, when is it my turn? Oh, I'm, I think I'm happy for them. And like, couldn't I do, I could be there too, right? And and so when, when he asked me to marry him, I thought, sure, I had reservations, but I thought, well, can I really do any better? And so I settled, you know, I, I just did. And it was the most miserable one year of my life. Without getting into very many details, it was just, I felt like there's a darkness mm -hmm. over me because it was wrong. Mm -hmm. He was not a Christian. It was clear that he was not a Christian, but I kept saying, no, 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 but he says he is. Oh, and surely he goes to church sometimes. And, you know, he says the right things when I ask him. <laughs> and so I, you know, I kept justifying it and justifying it and justifying it and, and just getting more and more miserable. And I thought, well, I've invested so much in this relationship up until this point because it, we were dating for two years. Um, a lot of it after a while because he was in the Navy, um, was long distance. So I'm like, all those phone bills, this was before cell phones, unlimited, you know, <laughs> mm -hmm. plans and so oh, all those phone bills that I had all those airplane tickets I had a lot invested and so I said no I mean it's got to get better you know I mean it's got to get better right and finally I had changed churches and some some of my friends loved me enough to ask the right questions and in in order to look them in the eyes and answer, because I couldn't answer them looking them in their eyes, in order to look, in, look at them in their eyes and answer honestly, I just had to come to grips with the fact that he was not right for me. We were not right for each other. There was no way that our marriage was going to honor God and get better hmm. if it wasn't already showing that. And so, let it go. And I have to say that that was the best decision. It was really hard. I mean, I cried and cried and cried. And, but, but after about a week, it was a huge weight has, had, that had lifted. And I felt like for the first time in years, I saw color again. Because remember I said, I, I, I felt like I was walking in this darkness. And it's because I was looking for for love and acceptance in the wrong place and feeling pressured into finding that love and acceptance and so was that pressure in your head or was there pressure from your parents from oh, your siblings from your friends to get married okay so i think it was just me okay, <laughs> okay. i mean i mean i think i can i conjured it up all myself but like i said i had a really huge family i still well they still exist so <laughs> yes <laughs> I have a really huge family seven kids in my family but my dad has three siblings and all of his siblings have at least nine children so they're, they either have nine or ten children and so our extended family was huge and so anytime we gathered together there were always people and they were married and they had children and I always it's like the irony of the whole thing is I felt so alone, even though I was amongst so many people. And that's because I felt like my singleness, my solidarity, mm -hmm. <laughs> it was amplified when I was around my family. And they didn't, I don't think they intentionally m made me feel that way, but it's when, oh, so-and-so is getting married now. Okay, so we're gonna have a shower. Oh, so-and-so is having a baby now. Mm -hmm. So-and-so is younger than I am. So-and-so is like way younger than I am. Oh my, you know, and I, I just felt like my years were going by. And so I think I put that pressure on myself. So whenever you show up at those gatherings, whether it was a holiday or, or whichever, were people in your family asking you if you, had, if you had a boyfriend? Were they asking you if you were seeing anybody? Um, sometimes, okay. but I think they knew that if I were, he would be there. Okay. <laughs> and so, you know, they didn't, 
they didn't they were, they were just always like oh hey monica you're or if i would bring my 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 girlfriends around mm -hmm. you know mm -hmm. i mean which is always fun so they knew well, i know for for some for some people that i know it's kind of the common joke every thanksgiving or every christmas mm -hmm. or you know every birthday that they're not seeing someone and, and it's devastating to that individual who's single and they start dreading family events because they know they're going to be asked, hey, are you seeing anybody this year? Where's your boyfriend? Where's your girlfriend? But I do have a question. So you said you were engaged for a year. At any point in, in that engagement, did, did you set a wedding date? No, we didn't. Okay. So, so yes. So I have another question kind of following that. Okay. Right? And, and I, this is an opportunity for you to give some advice. Mm -hmm. What would you say to an individual, we can say um, to a, a a female, if a mm -hmm. female's been engaged for a year like you were, mm -hmm. and she wants to set a date, but her fiance won't set a date. Okay. What advice would you give her? Follow that red flag <laughs> mm -hmm. and really, really wonder if he's committed to you, because if he really is committed to you, then shouldn't he be excited and anxious in a good way, not anxious in a bad way, but anxious in a good way to get something solidified, to even set a month parameter or a season parameter, like next summer. Okay, so let's talk about next summer then. Okay, when in next summer is good? Otherwise, I f because in retrospect, I think if I were to look back and because we had this arbitrary wedding that was pending that should have been a red flag for me and I wish somebody had told me hey so when when is the big day oh, I want to know when he's available when he could get off of work well surely mm -hmm. if yeah. he was serious if he were really serious he would have had a date mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. yeah I would say the same applies to to young men or just men mm -hmm. uh, when if you want to if you're trying to set a date and you've been engaged for eight months, a year, a year mm -hmm. and a half, and, and your fiance, she still won't set the date, that might be a red flag of, right. I, we might want to call off this engagement. Exactly. You know? And so, oh yeah, my wife and I, we had a rule, um, and we kind of interviewed each other. Like, I mean, it was, uh, hey, we're serious about getting married mm -hmm. and serious about dating. Um, so our story even is, is unique in that, in that regard. But, but we had this, this deal of, you know, six months is pretty much our max that we would want to be engaged. And then... Uh, or that or we'll just go to the courthouse and we'll just do a ceremony later but and if you can't get the venue till nine months from now that's different but right. I don't want to be engaged for four months and we haven't set a date and then now we've been engaged for a year or two years and mm -hmm. we're just still and I find that that I think a lot of times when that's the case people have been engaged whether it's for and again present day people have been engaged for a year or a year and a half and they haven't set a date I don't, it's difficult, again, this is just me personally, it's difficult for me to think that they're not playing house. Right. That they're, all, they're probably already right. doing the things, mm -hmm. and I'll be careful knowing that some adults could be listening to this with their children, but they're, they're most likely already participating mm -hmm. in the physical side of marriage. Mm -hmm. you know, and so, because I don't understand why if you were So wait, there's nothing to look forward right, to. Right, they're right. Just, they're already just playing house, mm -hmm. and it's kind of the, well, we're just going to have a, some, some test right. drives to see if this is going to work, and, right. um, and that might be what's kicking the can you know, right. down the road. And, right. uh, so another another question for you. If you if you have, because I do I do some marriage counseling, so I want to okay. get your so you're helping me counsel some other people here, okay? We'll see. <laughs> so if you have a couple and and they love each other, okay? okay? The boy and the girl, they they the guy and the girl, they like each other, but one of them has uh, they can see that there's going to need to be some boundaries put up with the other person's family. Okay. And and I know you don't marry the family, but you do marry into the family, and there is right. a joining of families in this union right. of marriage. Um, what would you say to someone that says, I love this person and I want to marry them, but the family is unbelievably difficult, causing me to question whether or not I even, I even want to be in a relationship with this person? I think that's a very real um, subject to ponder because even though you're only going to leave and cleave and become one, with, like the two become one, the family is a very real part of each person's past, present, and future. And so, oh, advice, um, get to know the family too and see if you're able to, to make a relationship and have a relationship and have a, 
if not decent relationship, a good one, <laughs> you know, at that, try to build something because they're not going to go away. And there are some very real problems that happen as a result of people not considering that aspect of marriage. My husband and I, we come from two very different cultures. I, we're both Americans, born and raised in America, but I'm from Hawaii and he's from Vermont. And I don't know if any of you have ever seen my Big Fat Greek Wedding, um, but that's kind of like our family. I mean, our, our story where our family is very loud and boisterous, island style. Everybody's welcome. Everybody gives hugs. Everybody, you know, we, we gather together all the time. We eat all the time. <laughs> and his family, it's not. They plan things. And I'm not saying that it's bad, but I'm just saying that's the reality of our, our lives. And when we came together, I mean, within the first month of marriage, my husband was really upset with me. And he started admonishing me. And he said, hey, you better stop kissing all those guys. And I'm thinking to myself, what guys am I kissing that's making him so upset? I'm like, our nephews? Who, who, who am I kissing? And he said, no, all the guys. So I had to think, well, you know, in Hawaii, when we say hello, we hug and we kiss. I mean, that's like one big act, one big greeting, hug, kiss, and then we let go. And so I'm thinking, are you talking about like everybody that we say hi to? And he was like, yeah, like your friends, your classmates, your coworkers, everywhere I go, you're kissing all the guys. Well, do you notice I kiss all the girls too? <laughs> I mean, that's, that's just what we do. But then I just had to come with two grips. Do I love my husband enough to be uncomfortable with my culture, within my culture, to let go of some of my culture so that my husband would not be tempted to anger or or jealousy or anything like that because it was real it for him because mm -hmm. that's not where he comes from so anyway um, what are you so to answer your question in a long roundabout way are you willing it's not that you're gonna change the other person because I could have easily said hey get get a grip that's my life that's my culture deal with it or are you willing to relinquish some of what you are tied to to be able to love that love your spouse enough to make them feel loved and cherished and honored and treasured as your spouse are they going to be are they going to be your number one human priority or are you going to make your family number one mm -hmm. and make them feel isolated? Mm -hmm. So, Speaking of uh, changing people, mm. I've seen this as well, and I wish a lot of this I haven't you know, seen and just, just right. experienced, but I've seen individuals, and, and I would ask them, do you think you're going to marry this person? And they would say, well, you know, there, there's some things, and this has gone both ways. Like I've talked right. with guys who said, do you think you're going to marry this girl? Well, there are some things I wish would we could address, but we can maybe fix that in marriage. Or do you think you're going to marry this guy? Well, there are some things that, you know, she would say that I wish I could change, but we'll address that in marriage. And the reasoning is, well, they've already been together for three years, or they've already been together for five years. And the thought of, well, again, like you said, they've already invested so much time. Right. And the thought of starting over, and, then, and, and it might be different when you're 19, but then once you start getting 23, 25, you're 28, you're 30 years old, things that you would have never accepted at 21, you're now settling for a lot mm -hmm. of times in, in your 30s. Um, speak to that, where if there's anyone listening, if there's a young woman listening or young man listening, and they're in that situation, they think something is off here, but I've already been with this person for so many years, I don't want to start over with somebody else. And I don't even meet other people, you know, that, if that's their, their reasoning. What would you say to them? Although it's hard and you feel like I can't live with this and this this will will change in them as the years go by that's a false hope hmm. um, because habits have already been created and if you haven't seen a change already 
what makes and with you in their life, then how do you think you're going to encourage them further after marriage to change if you haven't already done so? And so um, that's what I was thinking with my engagement too. And if you if you have all these doubts about them changing that you're going to fix, the only person that you have full volitional control over is yourself. And so it is really faulty reasoning to think that you're going to be able to change someone after marriage because there's more of an, an incentive before marriage, you know, if you really think about mm -hmm. it, for the person to change because they're like, well, I want to get married to you, so I, I'm going to change for this person. But even if they do so, is it going to continue on in marriage or is it just a false front that they're putting up just to get get married? Um, but if you're waiting till marriage to change them, I think it's really an empty hope that you're waiting for, waiting to happen because it's probably not going to happen. I'm going to change the subjects just kind of briefly, but we're, we're going to talk about Valentine's Day just just for a second. Mm -hmm. Let me rant just just for okay. the next two hours. I'm just kidding. I'm just kidding. <laughs> Maybe a minute or so. Let me just rant about Valentine's Day because I we're going to fast forward. <laughs> yes, yeah. Just skip ahead um, to tomorrow, and we'll. Um, but I don't like Valentine's Day, and the good news is my my wife also does not like Valentine's Day. So I know some some people will be like, yeah, well, no, she probably deep down does. No, my wife probably hates it more than I do. But I remember as a, as a kid in elementary school, Valentine's Day was fun because you could get candy and little cards mm -hmm. with cartoons on it. And then we got to middle school and we would have a Valentine's Day dance. And you, you, know, you didn't want to go to the dance solo, like single. Right. So, you wanted to, so you had to have a, a partner to go with you. So, we would, so you, we would get a date and then that now means that you have to buy chocolate and flowers or something. You had to buy a balloon for them. Um, and if you didn't have a date, you were quickly labeled less than, right? And that kind of follows you mm -hmm. then into your young adult years. You're like, you're the only one that doesn't have a date, you know? And, um, and, and there were years I had a date, and then there were years I didn't, but I just, I just began to hate it in middle school, began to hate everything about Valentine's Day. And then in high school, I would see girls that were dating just who I thought were jerks, like, this guy's just no good, and he's no good for you, and he treats you like garbage. But Valentine's Day is right around the corner, and because he gets you chocolates and a teddy bear, the girl would, would then give him three more months of a relationship or longer. And I just remember thinking, this is why I hate Valentine's Day. Because the guy can just treat you like garbage the whole year exactly. and then get you something on Valentine's Day or take you to a restaurant. And that's all he has to do mm -hmm. like to, to, to prove his love. So now I'm married and don't like Valentine's Day. And my wife is the same way. But I want to ask you, and that's my rant, so we're finished. Uh, <laughs> So you can turn the volume back up now if you're listening. But what do you think about Valentine's Day? I'm a bit indifferent to Valentine's Day. Like I neither hate it nor love it, but I do think it is overrated. Out of, I mean, we have 366 days in this year, and to focus on just one day on love and relationships, it's overrated. But I mean, it doesn't disparage the idea of focusing on love and relationships because I think that's what God wants us to do. Mm -hmm. I mean, he, God calls himself, he says, God is love and, um, and he is a God of relationship. And so I like to think of the cross as being a symbol of how we should have relationships because Jesus said, you know, the two greatest commandments, love the Lord your God with your whole heart, soul, mind, and strength. So that's the vertical relationship. And he says to love the Lord your God, you know. And so that's the love vertical. And then the cross, the horizontal, is love your neighbor as yourself. And so I think that is our command for every moment of every day. And so in that way, the idea of Valentine's Day is good. But I think we should carry it through every day of this year. I agree. How funny though would it have been after my rant if you'd have been like, I love Valentine's Day. It's my favorite holiday. Oh, okay. <laughs> let's, let's rewind. <laughs> <laughs> like, like, it's a day that means a lot to you. But I'm, I'm weird because I also, like, I know, well, maybe not with Valentine's Day, but I, I, don't like, I don't like celebrating birthdays. And I know that's terrible because my wife comes from a family that birthdays are a big deal. Yeah. And just for me, 
like I don't mind celebrating your birthday. Like I don't like when my birthday is made a big deal. It, mm -hmm. It's it's like I'm a grown man. It makes me feel weird that you want to throw a party for me. You know, like it's 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 odd right, for me. Right. Um, but for the other person, it, I can I can get behind celebrating your birthday. Right. But, so yeah, I just I don't know. I've got my quirks like that, but my wife does too. So that's a uh, we're a good fit. You know, we're a good fit. So here's a question. I know you mentioned it earlier, but when you were single, did you feel as if you were missing out on anything around not just Valentine's Day, but I want to use Valentine's what that Valentine's Day is really kind of an entry into other holidays. So, so for me, example, it wasn't, I didn't, and when I was single, and I, I felt like I lived singleness to the full uh, in terms of travel and uh, just, I, I, I enjoyed it. I want to make mm -hmm. the most of, right. of being single. And I know we're going to get to that as well, but I would, uh, I would, I would feel more sad and long for someone around other holidays, Christmas, Thanksgiving. Mm -hmm. That was when I was wishing that I was married. It wasn't Valentine's Day, but for you, when you were single, did you feel like you were missing out around the holidays? Did, did holidays heighten your awareness of your own singleness? I would say yes, because we have a big family. And like I, I mentioned earlier, you know, just being around all those people with all the couples. Now, they weren't the friends with the couples, but they were couples with children and reminding me of their life stage and my life stage was not there and so of course in the holidays even more family got together so it did it, it heightened my awareness of how single I still was so yes um, I sometimes I just didn't want to go to family parties to be really honest um, and so that's that's how it affected me but for the most part, our family, because we were like the My Big Fat Greek Wedding family, we got together almost every week. And so it was a reminder every week mm -hmm. <laughs> that mm -hmm. I was single. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. <laughs> but yes, but around the holidays, then even more of the extended family came together. So yes. I think in our culture now, we, we, we singleness is kind of synonymous with being alone. Mm -hmm. Speak to that, because they're not the same. So, so speak more to that for our young single women. That singleness doesn't mean you have to be alone. Right. So speak to that. Right. I think what that means is like where, I think a lot of people think that if, if you're with people, then you're accepted, you're, you're, you're a part of something and that, um, and you feel fulfilled in that. Um, but I think the singleness part of it is reminding you that you don't have someone to share your, your life with, to, to go back and forth, to rely on um, readily. And I think for me, it was because I I had, I wish what I know now about singleness, I knew back when I was single. Um, for example, like what drove me to settle for that engagement? What drove me to all of that? Well, because I felt so alone. But God, he tells us over and over and over again in the Bible, he will never leave us nor forsake us. And I, yeah, yeah, God's always with me. He's omnipresent, you know. But it is so true that He is always with me. And He is the one who fulfills that need, that emptiness in my heart that no one else in this world could ever fill. And so um, I think the singleness is just, for me, looking back, not realizing how much I had in Christ. Um, I'm not trying to diminish that you don't feel alone because I did, mm -hmm. and you, you are single when you're. I don't know if I'm making sense. No, you are. You are. Yes, but um, but I think if my focus were more like fix my eyes on on Jesus, the author and the perfecter of my faith, if I were to turn to, um, you know, in okay. I'll go back to that one in Hebrews. Fix your eyes on Jesus, the author and perfecter of my faith. If, you know, they say that if you aim at nothing, you will get there every time. 
you get nothing. But if you aim at Jesus and you just constantly are pondering him, then, you know, that fills your mind. I mean, he, he's got his whole Bible, his whole counsel to, to fill your heart and your mind with. Um, and then, you know, I was so dissatisfied. I was so discontent with where I was. But what I had hoped that someone would have told me when I was discontent in my life was to point me to Philippians 4. And in it, it says, in starting in verse 4, Rejoice in the Lord always. And that's not what I was doing. I wasn't rejoicing. Again, I would say rejoice. Let your reasonableness be known to everyone. The Lord is at hand. Do not be anxious about anything. And I was anxious. I was impatient, anxious, not settled in my heart. But in everything by prayer and supplication, with thanksgiving, let your requests be made known to God. And the peace of God, which surpasses all understanding, will guard your hearts and your minds in Christ Jesus. And I think that rejoice, I, I, when I was really deep down in, the, in a dark place in my life, I was like, Lord, but it says always. Is that really always? Rejoice in the Lord always? Like, but I, I, I'm really grieving right now. I'm really in a pit. And then I was like, but God's word, it says always. So what does rejoice mean then? I, it doesn't mean I have to be happy. So I looked it up and it basically means, it means favorably disposed, leaning towards or delighting in God's grace. And then it made me think, huh, so rejoicing, I have to delight in God's grace. I have to delight in what I don't deserve that I received. Jesus died on the cross for me and because of that, if I were to ponder that and not ponder my, my pitiful state of being, <laughs> you know, my singleness or sure. whatever it is. I mean, later on in life, it became, I was in my pity party, throwing my pity parties for myself because I didn't have children. And then, you know, and then now I could go on and on about how I don't really have a career because we keep moving every couple of years or less. And so I'm at home with my kids homeschooling, you know, and I have to keep homeschooling. And so all my friends, they're like this in their career. You know, I mean, I, I, whatever it is, the grass is always greener. There's always going to be greener grass to look at. But is that grass really greener? And that's what you have to really ask. Because God has given me the greenest grass ever <laughs> because he has died on the cross for me so that I can be with him one day in heaven. And if I ponder that, I can really, truly, and honestly rejoice always. And it says, and with Thanksgiving, um, I had read a book by Anne Voskamp, and um, in it she brings up this whole idea of Eucharist tale to, and a challenge to give one thousand thanks come up with your list of one thousand thanks to give to God and then you know as you go through and you you actually go through and write down your items I mean when you come to item number 623 I mean sure all the big rocks have been taken care of but then you're you're starting to look at all the details all the little blessings that God has given you and you you're like wow there's dew on this blade of grass. It's so phenomenal how it reflects the sky and how beautiful is that. Oh, there's, it's a gloomy day. Oh, but doesn't it feel like Christmas in Hawaii? Hmm. Isn't that, oh, it feels like Christmas today. You know, and just giving, thank you God for the reminder of, of a humid day of my childhood, <laughs> mm -hmm. <laughs> you mm -hmm. know, and, um, you're, you're just going through it. And when, you're, when you, your heart is full of thanksgiving, there's no room for self-pity and there's no room for woefulness. And guess where your eyes are? Fixed on Jesus, mm -hmm. the author and the perfecter of your faith. And I mean, so like I said, in retrospect, I wish someone had told me that way back when, when I was having my pity parties. 
But at least now, I still do have pity parties, sadly, because I haven't grown up. <laughs> <laughs> but but I'm, I'm more readily turning to him and saying, okay, what am I doing? God, what am I thankful for? What am I thankful for? And giving thanks. And his peace comes along with that. So I don't know what your original question was. <laughs> well, I think, I think in pursuing, pursuing God in singleness, um, again, I think there's far worse things than singleness. I think, uh, um, and the question was about, uh, is singleness the same as being alone? Oh, right. but, I'm but, sorry. I don't know if I, I ever know. answered that That's a good question. answer. It's a good answer. Um, but I think, I think too, in, in, I think there's far worse things than being single. Um, I mean, again, I, I've had conversations with several who, you know, a year into marriage, they're, oh, right. you know, their, their marriage is, is struggling Absolutely. or is doomed. Mm -hmm. and, and, and they feel alone. Right, right. And, and, but if they were honest with themselves, a lot of them are at this point, because right. it's kind of the hindsight 2020, there were red flags along the way that they either suppressed or ignored, or they thought, mm -hmm. well, uh, we will fix that in right. marriage. And um, again, when I say that I lived singleness to the full, and I, I believe my wife did too, it certainly doesn't mean I was wild living. I wasn't the prodigal right. son. It, it wasn't that. But what I meant, what I mean is, um, well, you know, that when you're married, not that I ask my wife for permission, not that she asks me for permission to go do things, but you do run everything typically right. by your spouse. Like I don't really make a purchase without running right. it by my right. wife first. Right. And um, but when I was single, I didn't have to. I didn't have anybody to run those purchases by. So mm -hmm. if I wanted to go overseas on a mission trip, it was just, can I afford this? Then I'm going. You right. Know? And I had a lot more time. It's. it's um, 1 Corinthians 7, if, if it's where Paul right. says there's nothing wrong with desiring to be married, and that's a great thing, but it's even better, you know, if, yes, if you have more yes. time, because if you're a, a man and, and you're married, your mind is set on your wife and how to take care of her, and if you have children, and so you're, mm -hmm. you're, you're, your mind is split between worldly affairs and the affairs of the Lord. And mm -hmm. same thing for women. You know, if you're mm -hmm. married to a husband and, and you have children, then your time is split between pursuing the Lord's affairs and then pursuing the world's, worldly affairs. Um, and so for single individuals, you know, what I would say, and again, I know we discussed, I'll give you time too, I want you to, I want you to speak to this, um, but I looked at that as I have time to disciple young men. I have, time, yes. I have more time now to myself be discipled. Right. I, I can exhaust myself completely for the Lord, and you can still do that when you're married, right. but it is different. Right. I mean, you got to take the kids to ball practice or recitals or whichever, um, and, and so it is different, but speak to that from a female perspective. How can you? How can how can young women who are in their twenties or thirties now who aren't married who are desiring a husband? Again, nothing wrong with that. They're desiring right. to be married, desiring right. to be uh, a mother, and there's nothing wrong with that. What would you say right now to encourage them in their singleness? How can they exhaust themselves for the Lord? Speak to that. Well, I think rewind this podcast and listen to what you just said about being used by God. I mean, because it is true that that God has availed you this opportunity of time and resources to be able to be used for His glory in a, in a very special way, in a very special season of life, whether it's six months or years long, decades long. But it's very unique to single, singleness that um, pray and ask God, for opportunities to be used by Him. And by the way, I mean, it doesn't have to be like a lightning bolt revelation, mm -hmm. right? I mean, I, I just remembered when when I had this whole weight lifted of my engagement and, and I was single again. I said, oh, okay, so what can I do for the Lord? And there were, you know, our, our church was notorious for giving us um, all these personality profile things and you know trying to make us peg us into different categories this is what you're going to be good at serving this and I would just say start serving start doing you you never know how God will use that and you never know what you what God will equip you with to be able to execute those for example um, our church was really big on sports ministries. I'm not very athletically talented, <laughs> but God. Well, if you're listening to this on the radio, Monica is 6'8", and she is a, and I'm just kidding, go, go <laughs> <laughs> Right, and so, um, so when we would have volleyball, a volleyball league, 
or a softball league. You know, they would be encouraging all our church members, hey, make a team and invite your friends. You know, this was our outreach. And so I'd be, okay, I don't know how to play volleyball, but I'd make a team. I was teaching high school at that time. So I had lots of people around me. I would pick up my students every weekend, <laughs> say, hey, who wants to go play volleyball? Pick them up, do my rounds, take them to volleyball practice, take them to volleyball games, the tournaments, all that kind of stuff. And you know, while we were, while we were in the car, we'd be talking and chatting about things. And, and to be really honest, um, so we had that, we had, and, I w and from that, then they would be interested in coming to church. So I would pick up a smaller group of people on Sundays, take about two hours, do my rounds around the island, <laughs> go to church, two rounds after, I mean, two hours later after church, you know, drop them off at home. And so um, I was a bit disappointed, to be really honest, because none of them ended up coming to know the Lord. None of them ended up staying at our church. And so I, you know, after a while I thought, well, how useful is that? I mean, am I really being used by God? And I would say yes. And not just because I got this letter like years after I had left Hawaii, but God uses everything. And it does, it's not for us to see, you know, when are we, are we watering, are we planting seeds? Are we watering the seeds? Are we cultivating these plants, you know, to grow? Or it's not for us to say, well, I'm gonna see the fruit of this labor eventually, but just to be obedient and to do what God has set on your heart to do. And then God will be faithful to, to follow through. And just to follow up on that one, um, like about five years after we had left Hawaii, I got a letter from one of the girls and she's like, hey, I taught Japanese. So she said, hey, sensei, I don't know if you remember me. Of course I remember her. <laughs> and she's like, I just want to let you know, remember all those talks we had and you, you kept saying da 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 anyway, but the bottom line was she started going to church and she remembered how I was encouraging her to seek the Lord and she said, so now I love God. I love him with my whole heart, soul, mind, and strength. Like, oh, mm -hmm. oh. I, I mean, I just started crying because really, honestly, I felt like it was futile. I mean, but that was just one, one aspect. But, you know, while, while you're free and you have the time, people at church would ask me, oh, can you do this? Okay, I'll be in charge of the drama for our church. Sure. Oh, we need another extra something for Easter. What do you think? We'll start a dance team. <laughs> you know, and I mean, but it, it's a great opportunity. If, if that were my season in life right now, I would have to reconsider my husband's schedule, my children's schedule, and to be really honest, that would not happen mm -hmm. today because I don't have that freedom, that luxury of time <coughs> that I did as a single person. So there's a lot available to really grow in and to really e experiment in a good way for the Lord to see how God can use you. And then, you know, I've, I discovered a lot about myself in serving the Lord and saying, okay, you know what? This area of ministry, not my thing. And it doesn't always have to look like it's great, but you, you were obedient and you served the Lord with gladness and he's moved you on to another season. And why do you think it's so difficult for singles to see or, or to fix their, their thoughts and their, you know, their, their minds and their, their eyes on opportunities instead of fixing their eyes on the fact that my older sibling's married or my mm -hmm. younger sibling's right. married and they have kids and I'm not even dating anybody and they're already married with kids. Why is it so difficult to, to forget about that and mm. fix our eyes instead on, as you said, the author and perfecter of our faith and our opportunities to honor God with our singleness and not look at our singleness as something God is punishing us for. Right, I think because we live in the world mm -hmm. and there are expectations within the world. Now, whether 
the people actually come out and say it, hey, where's your boyfriend? Aren't you getting married? Or whatever. Or just things that, like, like I said, you know, I had ideas of what my life would look like <laughs> at certain stages and um, just self-imposed expectations. But I think because we live in this world and we go through different seasons in this world because we are getting older, um, that puts pressure on us. And, and so when we look at the world's expectations, whether they're from other people, external or internal, they're not the godly expectations, like when we fix our eyes mm -hmm. on Jesus. So I know it's, it's, it sounds super easy to say, mm -hmm. but I, I really, tr truly, honestly believe it's true. <laughs> Absolutely. I think there's a lot of comparison too. You know, you say, well, I'd, what does this person have that I don't, or I'm comparing myself, I feel like if, and I knew from, from a, when I was a little boy, I knew I wanted to be a husband and a father. Right. And, and I prayed about it, and I just left that with the Lord, and I said, well, I'm just going to you know, walk in my singleness right. and just trust that God's going to provide that for me, and He did. And, and then, you know, I, I've heard just, because I was raised in the church, spent my whole life in, in the church, and, and I heard countless times, well, God will provide somebody when you're content. <laughs> And now we have, you know, hundreds of people, you know, or not more, I'm sure, but you know, walking around, well, I'm content, Lord, where are they? You know, yes. I'm content, Lord, where's yes. my spouse? Yes. And um, and I think with that, it can the result can be frustration with the Lord of how much more yeah. to have to do to prove I'm content. Now, where's where's this woman I'm going to marry? Or if you're a female, hey, where's this man? Right. Where's my husband? Where is he? But let's, uh, we'll get you out of here on this. I do want to spend some time because um, I value your opinion and I want to get your opinion on this. For my single guy friends who, who, who think the best way to pursue a girl is through social media or texting movies with a question mark, what would you say as a female, what can young men do to pursue a, a woman? And what should they not do? I think they should not send a text, but that's, that's me. That's probably true, <laughs> not send a text. You know, I mean, I was single in this non-smartphone mm -hmm. digital age. I even have to say before email. <laughs> <laughs> so, <laughs> so it was a little different, but I think the attraction for me, and you know, I'm, I'm just one person, mm -hmm. so I have my well, it's preferences. It's just our opinions, I'm sure. Yeah, it's my preference mm -hmm. versus, I, I like to see someone's heart first and and whether or not it is directly towards me but I can see it in action and so um, what I didn't realize was I was observing my my husband's actions whether I realized it or not and he was pursuing God that's what I was about to say I didn't want to interrupt you but so what you wanted to see was a man pursuing ruthlessly the Lord yes and you would find that attractive or desire yes. to say, I want this yes. man to pursue me yes. but if a man isn't looking at the Lord if he just starts pursuing you you're thinking wait a minute how much do you love let me see you right you know going after the Lord first right okay makes sense absolutely you know and it, it is kind of creepy if someone just pursues you and thinks that they are enough. <laughs> right, right, right. I don't know how else to say it mm -hmm. without me. <laughs> I heard one time too, and, I, and, I, and I've, told, I've told young men this, like junior high school, high school guys this, because um, it was something that was said to me, um, but it was, or it was something that was said to girls um, at this conference, this youth retreat where mm -hmm. you know guys and girls were there. Mm -hmm. um, but the speaker said to the girls, he said, ladies, keep your heart so close to the Lord that a boy has to go through God to get to you. Oh, that's and good. I, yeah, and I remember thinking that I was in maybe ninth grade or so, and I was like, oh, yeah, that's really good. I'm right. going to write that one down. And, and now, like, I'm going to tell my kids that, you know, right. um, that I don't, I don't want I don't want somebody sweet-talking my daughter. Like, you better love the Lord, you know, right. more than her, uh, or you're not going near my daughter. You know? Right, right. <laughs> and same thing I tell my son that. Like, you better pursue the Lord more than you pursue a girl. Right, and it doesn't stop at marriage, like right. at the wedding day. I mean, because that was that's some other good advice for for just relationship building in a marriage, you know, like if you're, this is what we give our, our couples. <laughs> um, if God is at the top of the apex and then, you know, each person is at either corner and you're pursuing God, then you're gonna grow closer to each other mm -hmm. naturally. Right, right. And so, so to answer your question, I want to see, yes, I want to see 
the man pursuing God. That's first and foremost of anything. And, and I personally like to get to know the person first as a person and not just to say, hey, let's just date mm -hmm. kind of a thing. Mm -hmm. But that's just me. Right, right. Because I, I get a little freaked out <laughs> otherwise. <laughs> uh, so we'll get you out of here on this because uh, we were talking earlier and you made a list. Oh, and right. and I did too, but but mine. Did you write your list down? Yes, I did. Okay, see, I didn't. I just kind of had these thoughts, and I would share them with my friends, thinking, "There's no way this girl exists." Right. And if she does, there's no way that she also has made a list, and I'm somehow Benefit. flawlessly that list. You know, like, there's no way her list is me, and yes. my list is her. Um, and I thought, like, I have unreasonable expectations. Right. But then I was like, no, I'm just gonna, I'm gonna wait and, until, and I'm gonna wait and see if I find this girl. This is what I want in mm -hmm. a wife, what I desire in the mother of my children. This is what I want. But, but for, for the women who may have their own list and think that that's silly, if you don't mind, would, can you share what was on that list? What, what you wanted in a husband sure. and the father of your children? What, what, what did you want? Okay. Can I clarify first? Go ahead. I was kind of forced to write this list. <laughs> Otherwise, I wouldn't have written it because I was, you know, I was, at, I was at a stage in my life where I said, I'm going to be like a Paulette, right? And I'm okay. going to just live for God and just, I don't need a man. And okay. I, I kind of got full of myself. But my mentor, who was my pastor's wife, she was one wonderful. And she said, ladies, I want to, I want to pray over your list for your future husband. And so I reluctantly wrote this list. And I laughed as I wrote this list because I thought this guy never existed either. And so um, what was on my list? Things like, he, this guy has to be able to do two hours of step aerobics in my class and still have more energy than I do. Because okay. at that point in time, I was teaching um, step aerobics and even in my second hour of teaching step aerobics, a new class, new people would come in. The guys were falling all over the place, like dying. And they said, <laughs> this is embarrassing for you. <laughs> yeah. And I said, no, if I'm going to marry someone, he has to have more stamina than that. And so um, that was one of the quirky things on my list. Also, I grew up in Hawaii. And I don't know if you know anything about Hawaiians, but we love our culture. And there's even a movement of, well, because Hawaii used to be its own kingdom. And so, but it was overthrown. I don't want to get political here, but, <laughs> but it was overthrown by um, the U.S. And so there's a group and a movement around the time when I was single that we wanted sovereignty in Hawaii. I shouldn't say we, but a lot of Hawaiians. So. They love their culture, they love Hawaii, but they wanted to really get back their culture. I mean, they wanted to make Hawaii a new kingdom again. And, um, and to the extent that there was a lot of prejudice in Hawaii against non-Hawaiians. Okay. And so I said, I, I, I want a man who loves the Hawaiian culture loves the Hawaiian people, loves Hawaii itself, loves Hawaiian music, even my, um, and even if it's more than me, but it's not so super fanatical about it that you have to go an, off an extreme end, mm -hmm. you know? And that was weird because in Hawaii you're either, you're kind of like, anyway. And, well, yeah, and also, not to be political, but uh, that's a big deal in relationships. It is. I mean, you can, you can, so in our country right now, I mean, there's nothing wrong with saying, I would like for us to be politically in sync. Uh, now, certainly spiritually in sync, in sync should be more than uh, right. politically in sync, but that's an okay thing to add to the list as well. Right, right, yes. Spiritually in sync, politically, in, yes. And, um, and I think I mentioned we had a really dysfunctional family growing up, and so marrying into the family, having to be able to accept all the good and all the ugly of our family and just being able to accept it, not judge it. I think everybody to a certain degree wants that, but I was always a bit embarrassed about our family um, in certain ways and I was done with being embarrassed about it. I wanted to just accept my family and just mm -hmm 
want my family to be to accept it also. Mm -hmm. um, but not, you know, not be ignorant of what happens, but just to be able to say no. I just still love you and your family as unusual and unique as you are. Mm -hmm. Yes. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so we got we got physically fit, politically in sync. Oh, there you go. You know, uh, I like how accepting, you're Yeah, accepting of, of one another's family. Yes. What else is on this list? Oh, okay. And height. <laughs> now that, that, that's, that's important. Yeah, yeah. Again, like if you're watching this, you're a six-eight basketball player. Right. And right. okay, that's, that's not true. That's not true. <laughs> I'm. Five feet on a really good morning. Okay. Yes. Okay. Yes. See, I'm six two after the chiropractor. Okay. Yes. My brother is six two. Believe <laughs> That's it. That's true, by the way. <laughs> yes. So I just wanted to make sure that he would, because I was thinking, okay, biologically, you know, if you ever take biology, I said, sometimes it's hard to be short in this world. So I was thinking ahead. If we had children, you know, I don't want them to all be m my height. And so, <laughs> give them a chance. Mm -hmm. So he had to be over five feet five. Mm -hmm. So okay. that, I mean, which is pretty easy for the most part, don't you think? Well, it's important to see the top of the kitchen counter. Right. You know, you want to see what, you know, what we're having on the, on the table for dinner, I, I guess. You I know? do chop with, on my tippy toes. I don't know if you realize. <laughs> I, I didn't realize it until a couple, couple of years ago and someone pointed that out. But anyway. Yeah. <laughs> um, what else was on this list? Uh, was it, was was the was your husband? Was he always walking with the Lord? Was he already a strong man of faith when you met him, or was that something that you had to wait for him to kind of catch up with you? That's a good question. So, when I met him, I think he was he had grown up in the church, and I think he was re-engaging with um, who he was in Christ and getting connected with um, discipleship and, and serving. And so I think I saw that. So all that to say, we were at the same church for two years and we never said a word to each other because our church was just that big enough where we could be at the in the same building. I mean, I might've said hi because I, I say hi to everybody, mm -hmm. um, but, um, but we never really talked, had a conversation at all for about two years. And it wasn't because I was avoiding him, but I avoided all the single activities. Um, and, uh, and so our, our circles never really did overlap. And so um, by the time we actually started talking, yes, he was mature in his faith. How long were y'all dating before you, you were wanting him to propose to you? Okay. And when did you know? When did you say, okay, this is beyond just friendship. I think I found, hey, hey this is my list. Okay, we, we've just got a unique story all together, I okay. guess. <laughs> okay. So, I was teaching high school, and I, at the school that I was at, they, they were going to only give me a half a line. And I couldn't afford living in Hawaii on a half a salary. So I started looking for another job. And so at the time we started dating, I was in the process of looking for a job. So maybe about a month after we started dating, I had offers. And one of the offers that I was looking at <laughs> was elsewhere on another island. And so we had to, we had our list of important discussion points mm -hmm. from the get-go because we weren't gonna, I mean, I was either moving to the big island or our relationship was serious. And actually, to be really honest, I didn't think our relationship was serious enough to stay. And so I was about to accept the job opportunity on another island and my wonderful mentor, Barb, found out about it like, hey, Monica, I heard that, and she's like, are you telling me that a, a career is more important than a family? And I said, huh, never thought about it that way, Barb. I just need to pay my bills. <laughs> 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 and I said, well, 
I mean, because we're not getting married or anything. Like, I don't, and all that to say, things happen really quickly. So we started talking in February. We had the M discussion probably in April. We got engaged in July and we got married in September. So you can put in all the, mm -hmm. do, you do mm -hmm. all the math. So it was really quick. But I think because we cut through the chase and we really did, we really did look hard and fast at really important things. Like we didn't, we didn't mess around with just getting to know each other. I mean, we got to know each mm -hmm. other. And oh, and by the way, because Barb knew of my, my past, she had recommended when she first started observing that we were talking, she says, oh, well, you know, Monica, you're going to need to know what his intentions are sometime. And he said, okay. So being obedient, because I didn't want to mess up again, I was like, okay, okay. So the next time I see him, mind you, this was within like a month of dating. <laughs> I was like, okay, I need to ask him that what are his intentions? What are his intentions? Okay. And so I did. He thought I was a little freaky, but I was like just being obedient because mm -hmm, <laughs> mm -hmm. I didn't want to mess up again. Mm -hmm. And so he just answered to me, I want to get to know you more. Mm -hmm. And so he I thought see, you were trying to force the marriage issue? Well, he wasn't sure. He okay. thought I was a little freaky. Okay. Yes. Okay. Yes. But I didn't use the M word. Right, right. And I, you know, because I just wanted to know. I said, well, what are your well, intentions? Well, that, that scares some guys away when you oh, start right. asking. Let's, did, name, let's name our children. Well, it's the first date. Let's, let's slow down. Right, right, right. But see, I didn't get that specific. <laughs> <laughs> some do, and, and right. some of them are probably listening. Quit naming children on the first date. But go ahead, Monica. Right, right. right. You don't have to you. dream together on the first date. <laughs> right, like that. But, you know, I just asked him, what are your intentions? And he, he was just very vague and said, I just want to get to know you better. And, you know, if it gets, if it's, if it goes well, well, we'll see what, what happens. And I said, oh, I think that's good, you know. But mm -hmm. so I kind of put us in a real awkward position to think about things more seriously early on. And when I told Barb that I had already asked him, she said, oh, no, 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 that's for later. Went, well, too late, but anyway. So you got married at, was it 26, you said? Yes. Okay, is, is the culture in Hawaii the same as it is in the South where, I know the demographics even in the South are changing where people are getting married later, but I mean, I got married at 28 and that was late by my standards. Again, I was right. fine in singleness, right. but I thought, like a lot of people, I guess, in the South, after high school, you go to college, four years of college, maybe one or two years of working, but by the time you're 25, you're already married with a kid, maybe a second on the way. Is that the same culture out in Hawaii as it is in the South? I would say so, or, or at least around my, my circles okay. of influence, I would say. So did, did you feel at 26 that you got married late in life by your standards? Yes. Okay. Yes. Okay. So for those, and we'll end with this, for those who are, what, what are your last words for those who are unmarried maybe they're dating someone but they're unmarried and it's late in life by their standards okay. whatever that standard is 23 right. 33 whatever their standard is uh, what's the last word you would want to say for them if they're wishing I wish I was married now but I'm just not how what are your last words of encouragement for them God knows your heart God is faithful and he wants you to pursue him most and foremost and he'll fill in all the rest. And he can be your deep satisfaction because whether you're single, you're married, you're divorced, you're widowed, everyone needs God and true ultimate satisfaction can only be found in him and so if you're yearning for marriage you might want to take a step back and say okay am I yearning for it for the right reasons because have I yearned for God enough yet and am I am I really hungering and thirsting after him first and foremost because I think that's what 
all of us. He, he asks of all of us, um, no matter what season we are in life. Well said. Monica, thank you. Thank you okay. for your time. And thank you all for listening.